Hi, this is Dr. Michelle from Life Renewal, and we want to welcome you and thank you for joining us. We are continuing in our series on codependency, a very important topic that so many people struggle with in varying aspects of their life. So before we begin, let's just pray. Lord Jesus, we just thank you for your faithfulness. We want open, humble, and teachable hearts to take your word in and apply it in every part of our thinking and life scale so that we can reflect you and walk in victory in Jesus' name. So we want to encourage you to stay for this whole teaching and not just listen to this, but learn to apply it. So when you became a Christian, you entered the kingdom of God exactly how you were with all of your thinking patterns, all of your life skill patterns, all of the ways that you spoke, you entered into the kingdom. And your spirit man was brought to life by Jesus. But all of the things that Jesus put inside your spirit man have to be moved out in a lifetime of work, in a process of sanctification. And you need to move it out into your soul area and your body. Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. So we need to take God principles, take God's giftings, and move it out into the practical application of our thinking, our life skill and relationship choices, our speech patterns, how we operate every day with boundaries, assertive skills, and every form of life skill. So often, when we're Christians, what we do is we take that old man that we died to, and all we do is dress him up. We named this series this particular week, Codependent Recovery, Don't Let the Old You Play Dress Up Games. Why? Because as Christians, we try to dress up the old man, and we get comfortable in patterns of dysfunction from our past, from our learned behavior, and we bring it into Christianity, and we have the same worldly thoughts and life skill patterns as in our past. And what do we do? Instead of tearing them down, a lot of Christians restructure them and try to get them to fit their concept and their perception of Christianity. Like I'm meant to serve, like I'm to deny myself and take up the cross. And we use those things and misapply them and take codependency and repackage it with a Christian twist. You hold firmly to elaborate forms of thinking patterns that you've developed over the course of your life. And then we try to substantiate those. And we walk into Christianity and we come in with maybe a victim mentality, a fear of being rejected or abandoned, so many of us have gone through many difficult life experiences, family experiences, and we have faulty identities and faulty thinking and many strongholds that a lot of us don't even have a clue exist. And we think we're being selfless. We think we're being a servant and we operate in the sin principles of codependency because they are not biblical principles. So we've said this before. God is a God of boundaries. You see it from Genesis to Revelation. The entire Bible shows you that God is a God of boundaries. So when we operate in codependent patterns that have no boundaries whatsoever, and we allow people to use us, hurt us, and exhaust us, and overburden us, because we're pleasing them and we use no confrontational skill, no assertive skills, and no boundaries, we try to wrap up this behavior pattern in a Christian bow. And we say, well, we're just serving the way that God tells us. But God is a God of boundaries. And as we're gonna find out in this teaching through many, many scriptures, this was never God's intention. So anything, that is contrary to Christ is a stronghold pattern. In 2 Corinthians 10, 5, it says, take every thought captive and tear down every stronghold. In proper interpretation of the Bible, you let the Bible interpret the Bible. In that scripture, it defines a stronghold. Every thought that sets itself against the knowledge of God. So when you have a thought, a life skill pattern, that's contrary to Christ, you cannot take it and adapt it into Christianity and think it's going to be acceptable for the kingdom because it will not be. And that's what happens with codependency. It is a nasty sin pattern that is even preached by the pastors 
and from the pulpit unknowingly because they do not understand. So we need to break these patterns. Humility is required to break any pattern. We have to see it, we have to humble ourselves, and we have to do what the Bible calls our work of sanctification, which is being set apart for God's principles and tear down these strongholds. In Christianity, you and I and all of us in this room have been taught to deny yourself, take up your cross, die to yourself. Well, how do we filter that through our thinking? Because on the other hand, the scripture says that God wants you to have an abundant life, that he came to give you life abundantly. Is God contradicting himself? How do those two things match? The scripture assumes that you understand that you have personal interest, that you have personal responsibilities, that you have a personal load that you need to carry every day. And the Bible never tells you to drop your personal responsibilities to take up the responsibilities of others. So how do these scriptures fit in to the picture of codependency and boundaries? Let's start with Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 and 21. It says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I live, which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. In this verse, the first thing, and in my Bible series, if you've ever watched those, I talk about uh, understanding the Bible, using proper rules for interpretation. One of the things is look at the original language it was written in. The words I in this scripture are two different Greek words. Paul is saying there's a dead Paul and there's a living Paul. He's talking about the old self and he's talking about the new self. He's saying that when he accepted Jesus on the cross crucified, he died to worldly things, thought patterns, speech patterns, behavior patterns, religious beliefs. He died to those things when he was crucified with Christ. This emphasizes that he is dead in Christ, but nevertheless he lives. So he is, not, he is saying that not the old man, such as I once was, I was a Jew, I was a Pharisee of Pharisees, but I'm another man. That is what he's saying. He is different. He is transformed. Paul is saying that the old man is dead, and now he allows Christ to live in and through him. And this lifelong process of sanctification is allowing the Spirit of God to transform every thought, every speech pattern, every behavior pattern, every relationship pattern. You are transforming all of your worldly belief systems and behaviors, all of the dysfunctional patterns you learned in the culture, in your family, maybe in your marriage, wherever the sin patterns developed, you're allowing God to come in and change it so that you can reflect him in everything you say and everything you choose. Paul is now living in God and it's a stark contrast to the past reflection of who he once was. So we look at this contrast of your old life and the new life and it requires you to crucify thought and behavior patterns, to tear down and rebuild things in agreement to the word of God. You cannot dress up codependency and try to make it appear acceptable and selfless as a practice in Christianity. And this is what many, many leaders and Christians do. You are to die to the old man and care for the new man. Dying to self means crucifying everything. And so a lot of people think, oh, well, I'm no longer doing sex, drugs, and rock and roll, so I've arrived. There's so much more than those outward behaviors. Most of it is right here in the thinking that drives everything that you do and everything that you say. God does not want you operating out of the wounds of the past. Growing up in a fallen world, you have developed worldly patterns. There is no one on the planet but Jesus who did not. And the scripture says, 
and he had nothing in him. Satan had nothing in Jesus. He had no worldly pattern in Jesus. He had no life skill patterns that were unholy. He had no thinking patterns that were distorted. He had nothing in Jesus. But you and I, we're another story because we were born in a fallen world and we transform by receiving God and letting him work through us. Romans 12, two says, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can test and approve God's perfect, pleasing or acceptable will. When you operate in codependency, you do not set clear boundaries or any boundaries at all for that matter. Now, if God is a God of boundaries, how is it that we're doing that and thinking it's godly? So let's look at a boundary as a fence. I have a fence around my yard because I have a pool in my backyard. I need that fence up to protect kids from coming in, to protect my pets from getting out. And if I didn't have a fence, my neighbors wouldn't know where my yard started and where my yard ended. I would not be able to keep my possessions there in a secure place. I would not be able to be sure that people would not come and disturb them. I would not be sure that, that my animals would be contained and they could be lost and not found. Boundaries enable you to be who you're called to be, to remain focused on God and the purposes that he has for you. You must set up boundaries because there's things trying to get you off track every day of your life. The lack of boundaries is the foundation of codependency. God calls you to die to your flesh. Well, that doesn't mean only the taking care of everybody else. It means die to patterns that don't agree with them. And so you are to die to a sinful codependent pattern and operate in agreement with the word. So this is what true death of self is. Codependency is a foe fake version of this, thinking that you're being selfless, thinking that when you rescue and save people and fix their problems and provide for them and rescue them from natural consequences, that you are being selfless, but in that reality, you have no boundaries and you're doing a codependent pattern. It is applying God's principles with boundaries in every area of our life that we walk into the freedom promised by the word. When you do not understand how to discern and take responsibility for different times and issues, when should I, when shouldn't I? I have to have a discernment tool to understand where I'm carrying my load or carrying your load and when it's pleasing to God and when it's not pleasing to God. Many people, I tell people this in counseling, have broken pickers. They pick the wrong kind of people that suck the life out of them. Relationships that need healing and restoration. People start relationships feeling needed, feeling wanted, and they end up being pressed and burdened. So we have to understand that we have a right to set boundaries in our life and not be afraid of setting boundaries, being afraid that we'll be rejected or abandoned or not receive the love and acceptance we crave. And we have to tear down those thinking processes. Part of this is about knowing who you are. Know your identity. Who are you in Christ? The Bible is very clear on your authority, my authority, and the God-given identity that God put in every one of us. He has picked things for you and I to do and fulfill by the way that he's designed us. And no one thing is more important than another. Jesus displayed through all of his life skills, excellent boundaries, excellent assertive skills and life skills and confrontational skills just off the chart. If we read the Bible to look for those things, we would see that. He knew when and how to use these skills. And it came from him feeling confident in who he was, what his purpose was, and what he was to do every day of his life, being directed by the Father to focus on God and his callings. Jesus gave an, ex an example from 12 years old when he was in the temple on Passover and he was there for a purpose. And when his parents left and he remained and they were concerned when they came back for him, was he irresponsible? 
where his parents responded to him and said in Luke chapter 2, verses 49 and 50, and he said to them, why did you seek me? Do you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand that statement which he spoke to them. So clearly we see his parents didn't understand this. But Jesus, even as a child, in childhood, knew who he was. He knew he had a course to run. He stayed on a straight course every day of his life, focused, because he knew his callings and he would not allow himself to be distracted. Could he be about his father's business and focus on the cares of the world? But yet we could say Jesus was very concerned with people. He loved people. He wanted to minister to people. His heart broke for people. But he didn't allow himself to be taken out of order with that love and care. He looked at the needs and he sought the Father to see what he was supposed to do and what he wasn't supposed to do. And when he wasn't supposed to do something, he didn't apologize. Even in this scripture, he did not apologize to his parents. He respectfully said, and this is one explanation he gives here, a lot of other scriptures he doesn't explain to anybody, but to his parents he did. I'm about my father's business. Isn't that why I'm here? Do you not know who I am? Okay, he didn't apologize for what he was supposed to do. He didn't take on his mother's stress and worry, his father's concerns. He didn't take on the stress and anxiety of his family. He maintained healthy boundaries and appropriate self-care and stayed his course even at 12 years old. You and I have daily choices. We either stay in the father's purpose, person, <laughs> purpose or we get distracted. I don't know about you, but it is easy to get distracted. And we have to ask regularly, should I do this or shouldn't I do this, God? We are not called to be someone else's God. We are not called to our loved ones to be their savior and meet their needs. God has many servants. You are not the only one. Why do you think that you have to be the one to save and rescue and fix and redeem somebody from the consequences of their choices? This is going beyond your boundaries and you're taking God off the throne and putting yourself in place of God and seating yourself on the throne. And then the people in your life are looking to you for the answers, looking to you for the help, looking to you for the comfort, and they're taking their eyes completely on, off of God. You are not doing them good, you are doing them harm. We have to understand that there are many good works and services that we are as Christians called to. But when you operate in codependency, it ceases to be led by God. And what you think is good is actually sin. 1 John 3, 1 says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. God loves us so much, he calls us his children. We're not his slaves, we're his children. Your identity is a child of the Most High God. That is who you are. You do not need to grovel for your needs to be met. You do not need to grovel to have provision. You have the full rights and privileges of an heir with Christ. You are not an accident and you are not a disappointment to God. Even if you're a work in progress, which we all are, we were purchased by his blood and he cared enough to die. This is the love of the Father. This is your identity. James 1.5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. You have access to God. Seek him for discernment. Go to him to answer the questions of what you should and shouldn't do. Let him direct you in every choice in your life daily and in your relationships. Jesus said, I do what the Father tells me to do. He was clearly guided by God. He didn't make the decisions on his own. Now, through wisdom, you can apply boundaries. Wisdom in Proverbs, there's two words in Hebrew, and one of those words is applied skills. So wisdom is applied skills. 
Apply those skills to boundaries. Codependent choices are never wisdom. It requires you to know who you are in Christ. It requires you to be without fear to try to hold on to things and save and rescue things and be able to use a voice even when you might feel a feeling of fear of rejection or fear of abandonment or worry that you won't be accepted. Those things are not of God. And when we struggle against them, we need to say no, understanding our true identity. You can follow Jesus's example. John 4, 25 and 26 says, The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. What is he clearly showing us? He knew who he was. He revealed who he was. He knew what his calling was. He knew he came to redeem mankind and pay for sin. He never let it out of his mind what his plan and purpose was. He did not let the enemy distract him. He did not let people distract him, even though he loved them and came for them. You do not need to struggle against these life skill patterns that are destructive. You need to understand your identity and you need to know that there are traps and rabbit trails that were laid for Jesus and they were laid for you as well to take you off course for your life. Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, hungry and tired and thirsty at his weakest. He was tempted, but he didn't forget his identity even though his identity was attacked. He didn't get off the course he knew he was on. Even at his weakest, he did not allow the distraction or the snare that was laid to get him in his weakness. Satan uses people, and he uses the people closest to you even more sometimes. Maybe it's not their intent, but it's still the truth. And when people are being used around you as a snare, and you're attacked in your weakness, you're attacked in your stronghold because of these mental strongholds, you have got to not give in and restructure the codependent stronghold patterns of thinking that the enemy desires to use to destroy your plan and your testimony. It is through having a solid identity and applying wisdom and walking out godly life skills that you cannot be swayed from the goal before you. Jesus gave you a beautiful picture that he never allowed himself to be hindered for redeeming us from our sin. Thank God. When we look at this, we need to have this revelation and stay steadfast. 1 Peter 2.9 says, you are a chosen generation a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Knowing how you are in Christ makes you powerful to face anything because you will know who you are, who you belong to, who is in you, and the power that you can operate through with authority because you are in him. Colossians 2.9 says, For in him dwell all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. When it says principality and power there, it is talking about the hierarchy of a demonic structure of evil spirits. And it's telling you that you are powerful in Christ. You are complete in Christ to pull down anything. That whatever comes against you, all the powers of hell cannot prevail if you, you can overcome the schemes of the enemy. Anything levied against you cannot prevail when you walk in accordance with the word. Too many people don't remain in him and then they feel like God's promises are not true. Well, you're not remaining in him. The scripture in James 4, 7 says, Submit yourself therefore to God, resist the enemy, and he will flee from you. This is not a lofty command. I wrote it in the text for the people in this class that it is easy and clear. One, submit to God. Two, 
Say no to the enemy. And three, you will disperse your enemies. So what does that mean? If you submit to God, you can't rationalize your sin patterns. You cannot deny them. You cannot minimize them. And you cannot make excuses to continue in what may very well seem comfortable, but is a destructive sin pattern. When you submit to God, you say no to first the thinking and change it by the renewal of your mind, which is repentance, metanoia, changing your mind. And that change in thinking that aligns to the word produces new fruit in your speech and in your behavior and relationship patterns. And you stay in line with the word of God. Now, there are many, many characteristics and descriptions of codependency. I made a very short list in this teaching. And they are a lack of boundaries, needing the approval of others and being driven and compelled to receive that, valuing others' needs over your own needs, doing not trusting yourself but feeling like maybe I'm wrong, maybe I should give in to this, making other people's opinions more valuable than you, fearing the abandonment and the rejection and the pain that may be caused if somebody else suffers, and unhealthy dependence on your relationships an exaggerated sense of responsibility, not knowing where yours begins and other people's um, ends. So hypervigilancy about other people's feelings. You're always concerned every choice I make is based on someone else's feelings. Loyal to the point of error. Putting aside your own interest and goals to take a back seat to what other people need and believing that most people are incapable of taking care of their own load without your help. When you submit to these thinking patterns and these life skill patterns and these become your relationship dynamics, you are not submitting to God. So why then are we so surprised that the enemy is plowing us? Submit to God, lay these things down. Let them be transformed by changing your mind and then putting, producing new fruit in keeping with repentance. And then you are resisting the snares of the enemy and then you will drive him away and he will flee. When you submit to God, everything changes. And in Christ, you are a child of God. You have his power complete in him, his attributes, his strength. They're deposited in your spirit, man. But you have to choose to do the work of sanctification and move them from your spirit, man, into your body and your soul area. That means you do not have to fear anyone or anything. You do not need to please people to be accepted or loved or received. You do not need to enable others. You do not need to save and rescue. You don't need to operate in a sin pattern in an erroneous way thinking that you're going to help yourself and self-protect. God has a better way. You can rid yourself of these patterns when you stand firmly on God. Matthew 5:37 says, "Let your yes be yes and your no be no." For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. When you operate in codependency, you say yes to the wrong things. You say yes when you mean no. You are compelled to keep giving beyond measure. You care for everyone but yourself and you are boundaryless, which we've already established is not Christ-like. As Christians, you're twisting biblical principle and you view self-care as the equivalent to selfishness and sin. No, self-care is not selfish and it's not sinful. The, the teaching and the preaching that tells you that you are gonna be taken care of by God if you just never worry about taking care of yourself and take care of everybody else is erroneous teaching because Jesus didn't do that and he didn't teach that and I'll prove it. So the Bible clearly teaches the importance of self-care. You cannot give and serve from a dry well. There is nothing to scoop out of a dry well. You're going to get a cup of dust. Living water should be flowing through you. And living water is only going to be there when you take time to be alone with God, take time to be alone with yourself, feed and care for yourself physically, emotionally, and spiritually. 
You have to do self-care before you can care for others. And beginning your ascent into freedom from codependency, you have to change your thinking patterns and process and implement boundaries and these principles. And so many of you may be thinking right now, oh, but I love them. I hear this every day. But I, I, I don't want them to face these consequences. If I don't help, who's going to help? I have to be the one to rescue them. I'm the only one there. I have to be the one to rescue and res rush in and fix the problem. If I don't do it, who's going to do it? It has to be me. This thinking pattern is contrary to Christ. You are becoming someone's savior. Jesus loved and cared for people. He came to earth to die for people. But yet Jesus still, with that as his number one calling, took care of his own needs first. So Jesus modeled self-care for us. He came from a position of power, knowing who he is, and he didn't need to do bad behaviors to prove his identity or be encouraged or be accepted. He did not care what anybody thought because he knew who he was. And that could be a lesson all in itself for many of us. Jesus did not feel compelled to sin, be sin in codependent patterns. He was not compelled to explain or clarify his identity or why he did what he did. He remained focused. He did not apologize. He did what he was supposed to do, and when he was responsible for something, he followed through, and when he didn't feel responsible, he let it go. He did not carry the anxieties of others, and that is something in codependency that we do. He gave us an amazing example of strong identity, healthy boundaries, communication skills, conflict resolution skills, and, and every imaginable life skill. If we examine his life, we see what is healthy, non-dysfunctional behavior patterns. Where there is dysfunction, there is sin. The church needs to understand dysfunction and sin are equivalent because there is no godly way that is dysfunctional. The following scriptures show us how Jesus controlled his emotions, his thinking patterns, his speech patterns, his life skills, his choices. Jesus was selfless at giving while he still cared for himself. He recognized when to give and when to stop giving, when to take care of his needs and when to take care of others' needs. So let's read Luke 5, 15 and 16. Um, However, the report went around concerning him all the time and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. So he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. Okay, does that sound like he poured himself out 90 hours a week and he barely got five hours sleep because he had to keep giving, 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 giving because the church had a need. Now, what did it say? He himself, what? Often, often withdrew. Why? Because he's getting filled back up. He was restoring himself. He was getting rest in the presence of God in prayer. Mark 1, 35 through 38 says, Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. But when they found him, they said to him, Everyone is looking for you. But he said to them, let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also, because for this purpose I have come forth. What would you do if you had the power to heal and everyone was flocking to you? Most of us would have our egos buttered and we would just be pouring out, pouring out, pouring out because it's all about us and that's wrong. If you feel responsible to never stop and never take a rest, is that an example that Jesus gave? Jesus withdrew to the solitary place, it says. He went to rejuvenate himself. He filled himself back up. He needed to care for himself to continue to serve the people. We can't serve out of our brokenness. Many Christians would, in this example, kick into work addiction mode. The workaholics in us would come out. We would be looking for that praise that uh, buttering up, that puffing up to say, we're so needed, look at my giftings, look at my talents, everybody needs a piece of me. 
and we would forsake the time we need with self and we would be feeding the carnal man, not the spiritual man, by doing the work of service. How many of you do works of service in the church to feed the carnal man? That is out of order. You are not supposed to serve with that motive. So when we look at this, we see that Jesus cared for himself. He continued to serve the people. So what happens when we go into workaholic mode and we will forsake the time for ourselves? We for forsake our own health, our own nutrition, our own need for exercise, our own need for sleep. And many, many people forsake their families. I say this to leadership families all the time. It's out of order if you do not take intentional time for your wife and children, husband and children, because you are out of order. God is first, but the church and God are not equivalent. Because you need to volunteer on Children's Church or Wednesday night, if your wife is sick, if your spouse is having a stress or problem, you are there to serve God and your family. You do not forsake your family for everybody else and think you're doing the will of God. So we need to understand that we are called to serve, but serving codependently is not holiness. It is out of order. So Jesus was not disturbed and he did not apologize for disappearing. Here he is. It says clearly, Simon and those who were with them were looking for him. They're like, hey, where's Jesus? Where did he go? So maybe they were frustrated. Maybe they were mad. Who knows? It doesn't tell us that. But they came to him like, dude, where were you? And what would most of us do in that situation? He, he didn't question himself. He didn't make any excuses. He didn't deviate his plan. He simply said, let us go. Meaning, okay, we don't need to talk about this. This is what we're supposed to do. This is my calling. Let's do it. And the question you have to ask yourself is, what would you do in that situation? If somebody came to you, came to your door, came to you from in the church and said, where were you? I had needs and you weren't there for me. What would you do? You were found resting when somebody had a need. What would you say to yourself? Would you be overwhelmed with guilt? Would you say, oh, I'm so sorry. If I would have known you needed me, I would have been there in a jiffy, which is what most of us do. Even though maybe we weren't supposed to be there. Maybe they needed to go to God directly. Would you beat yourself up? Would you question everything you feel? Would you feel unhelpful? Would you feel selfish? Because if you do, this is not Christ-like. This is codependency. If you would have been thinking any of these patterns of thought, it is codependency. That is not how Jesus responded. He knew that self-care was way too important to neglect it. He didn't apologize for meeting his needs. He was being unavailable to others to meet his need, and it was not wrong. He felt no need to explain why he was taking care of himself and his personal needs. And the godly principle of self-care was so obvious that he felt no reason to give an explanation. Why do we? He does not let other people's emotions control his responses. Jesus was grounded in truth. Codependency steals your focus on God being first in position because you're more concerned what that person thinks of you than you are of what God thinks of you. I do not want to be a man pleaser. I want to be a God pleaser. And just so you know, I certainly struggled with codependency in my past and I'm an overcomer. So we all can overcome this and understanding that if God is not first, we are being robbed of faith, of strength, of promises, of provision. Codependency is a set of faulty life skills. It steals your peace. It steals your identity. It steals your purposes. It steals your voice. And simultaneously, it blows up your relationships. You may think if you say no to that alcoholic, if you say no to that person raging, if you say no to that person who always has something broken in their world and needs rescuing, you may think that you're going to have worse relationships, but you're going to have better relationships. If you stay in codependency, it keeps you striving. 
It keeps you always feeling guilty, always being worried, always being fearful, being overburdened, being overwhelmed, being sick to your stomach, not being healthy and take care of yourself, and clawing to get your needs met and self-protect. This is not God's way, and this is not God's plan for you. John 10.10 says, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Codependency is an unhealthy thinking pattern that produces unhealthy life skills. And we need to replace it with God principle. God wants your needs met. He cares about your needs. But you need to trust him and not shove him out of the way and do it yourself in a faulty, dysfunctional way. He wants you to experience the fruits of the Spirit and have abundance in every area of his life. But you need to realize that what you choose is a seed that's planted and there will be a crop harvest from what you plant. You will reap a consequence. So if you're doing it out of order, you will not reap God promises. If you're doing it sinfully, you will not reap good fruit. It is common sense in the scripture. When I say Jesus displayed self-care, there's a lot of you that are listening to me and it's going right over the top of your head and you're thinking, that can't be true. This is contrary to everything I've ever been taught. This is contrary to the belief systems I've operated in for 25 years of Christianity. And it may be a surprise to you that the Bible is talking about self-care. It may challenge every single faulty core belief you have. There was years ago when God said to me, I, I was questioning something I was taught by a leader, and God said, uh, who are you going to believe, me or who taught you? Well, hello, that's a non-brainer, no-brainer. People are human, they make errors, not because they're bad people, not because they're necessarily apostate, just because they don't interpret everything properly. So I need to get God to lead me to truth. So if I'm challenging your faulty core beliefs, things you've been taught in the past, you need to ask yourself, are these things you're taught wrapped in codependent principles? Because if they are, then you are not doing it God's way. And you've been taught that self-care is selfish and bad. And that is not what the scripture says. Philippians 2.4 says, Let each of you look not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Now look at how that's worded. Look not only, what is that doing? It's assuming you understand you have to look at your own interests. It's not saying forget your interest and only look at others. Take care of them and God will take care of you. Yes, there's truth to that, but it's 98% tr truth, 2% lie if we do it in a codependent mindset. So what we have to see is coming from that position of thought, like we're not supposed to care for our own in interests, and only care for others, then we're not understanding self-care at all. And we're not doing it God's way. How did Christianity lose this simple concept of self-care? Because if we care for ourselves, then we care for others. But if we adopt codependency as a form of care of others and service and godliness and holiness, then all we're doing is bringing sin into Christianity. Your interests are important. Other people's interests are important. You don't, it doesn't say stop being concerned with your interest. It just tells you, hey, don't forget others. Well, you're busy focusing on what you need to do, the things you need to do, the things you need to do to take care of your kids. You have all these things going on in your world. And I tell people the extreme of this is, I've got soccer practice on this day, basketball practice on the day, I'm playing golf on this day, I have bridge tournament on this day. Okay, are you too busy? Because if you're too busy, then you can't give to anybody else. Well, in that case, cut some things down, but that's not what this is talking about. Your interest, I gotta clean my house, I gotta take care of my children, I need to feed my marriage, I need to have time to pray, I need to have time to spend time alone with God. Those are your interests, pay attention to them before you meet the needs of others. It acknowledges that you will look to your own interest first, and then it encourages you to not forget about the interest of others. 
In a previous chapter of this same series, in Galatians 6, 2 through 5, we discussed in depth, but it can bear to be repeating, the scripture of Galatians 6, 2, 5. So let's read it again. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ, which is also the law of love. For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For each one shall bear his own load. So it's clearly telling us that we're to bear someone's burden. But yet, it's not schizophrenic. It's also saying that you're to examine your own work and you're to bear your own load. So a lot of Christians read this scripture and all they hear is carry someone else's burden. They don't see anything about examining their own works. They don't see anything about being responsible to carry their own load. We discussed in the latter chapter that those two words, burden and load, mean different things. I am to carry my personal responsibilities. And if I have a special burden, let's say I'm sick or I'm hospitalized or I lost my job, now it's a heavier burden than I can bear. And I can expect that my brothers and sisters will put a shoulder under that and help me with that heavy load. That is what it's disgusting. But the scripture clarifies what it means by at the end saying, for each one shall bear his own load. It is not telling you to forget about your responsibilities, to not hold people accountable for their responsibilities, and to do it all. That is not what it's saying. It's helpful to understand this with an analogy. So let's look at your personal responsibilities as something you put in a backpack. You're going on a hiking trip, and you're going to carry this, bike, this backpack as you hike up the mountain of life. So in your backpack, you have to put every personal responsibility. Your finances are in there. Your provisions for food are in there. Your clothing is in there. Your thoughts are in there and your emotions are in there. Everything is in your backpack. And you have to hike up a steep mountain of life and carry that on your back. So if you think thoughts like, well, what will people think? And what will they do if I don't help? And you start to stuff their needs their provisions, their thoughts, their emotions in your backpack. What's going to happen? It's going to become too heavy for you. You can't carry two people's backpacks. My daughters went backpacking after they graduated from college. And I said, boy, that sounds fun. I'd love to go with you. And my youngest daughter said to me, well, here, mom, try this. She put her backpack on me, one of those really big backpacks. I almost fell over backwards. That is not something that you could carry two of. I couldn't barely hold one. And they laughed at me, of course. If I try to carry my load, and I try to carry your load, am I ever going to make it to the end of the course? Am I ever going to make it up the mountain of life carrying my stuff and your stuff? No, I was not designed to do that. That is not the mantle that God is dropping on your shoulders or my shoulders. That is not what he is calling you to do. He is not calling you to carry the load that someone else has a responsibility to do for themselves because each man and woman must carry their own load. The biblical principle is simple. Each of you must carry your own load and when you run into an additional challenge, it is now a burden that you can't carry alone. Then you should help each other and support one another. So if I'm backpacking with you and I'm carrying the backpack and you break your leg, that I'm going to have to find some way to make a gurney to drag you, your backpack, and my backpack on so I don't leave you there alone. But other than that, you need to carry your own backpack. Moses is an example of a godly man who was leaning toward codependency himself, as the scripture reveals. He bore the burdens of the people. He cared about the people. He loved the people. And the Lord has to tell him to gather the 70 elders so that, quote, they will help you carry the burdens of the people. Why? Because God said, this is too much for you, guy. This is not what I intended. You cannot carry the load of all these people yourself. This is something that needs to be a shared responsibility. It was not God's call or holy to carry the mantle alone for the entire nation. So likewise, you are not called to carry all burdens. 
physical burdens, emotional burdens, uh, psychological, financial, spiritual, just practical burdens. You were not called to carry those in your relationship. You have to tear down the thought patterns that this is Christian service because it's not. It's raging codependency, a sin pattern. You will not earn the love and approval of God or men through a sin pattern. So let's read this scripture, which is a little bit long about Moses in Exodus chapter 18, verses 13 through 23. Moses sat to judge the people and the people stood before Moses from morning until evening. So when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did for the people, he said, what is this thing that you are doing for the people? Why do you alone sit and all the people stand before you from the morning until the evening? And Moses said to his father-in-law, because the people came to me to inquire of God. When they have a difficulty, they come to me and I judge between one and another and I make known the statutes of God and his laws. So Moses' father-in-law said to him, this thing you do is not good. Both you and these people who are with you will surely wear yourself out. For this thing is too much for you. You are not able to perform it. Listen now to my voice. I will give you counsel and God will be with you. Stand before the people, before God for the people so that you may bring the difficulties to God and you shall teach them the statutes of the Lord and show them the way in which they must walk and the, the work they must do. Moreover, you shall select from all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifty, and rulers of tens. And let them judge the people at all times. Then it will be that every great matter they shall bring to you, but every small matter they themselves shall judge. So it will be easier for you. They will bear the burden with you. If you do this thing and God so commands you, then you will be able to endure and all this people will also go to their place in peace. What a clear picture. What was Moses doing? I'm a church leader. I'm supposed to work from sundown, sun up to sundown and never stop. Why? Because the people have needs. Because the people need to know the Lord. Because the people know, need to know what to do to live their lives right. And so this is what I got to do and I am the only one that can do it. This is part of the error in the kingdom. It's not supposed to be a one-man show. We are supposed to be equipped as servants of God to do the works of service. Each man in the church according to what God has called them to. So his father-in-law tells him, you think you're doing good to serve the people this way, but you're not. And God is commanding you to divide the responsibility, to only take the part that he has given to you, to only deal with the heaviest of burden. Let all these other leaders handle this, back up, don't be a control freak, don't be codependent, don't have a God complex, and don't do too much. Okay, that's my way of saying it, but it's clearly in the scripture. Moses in this scripture has good intentions. He cares about the people. But he set no boundaries for himself. He operates in over-responsibility, exceeding what God required. And the thing he did was said to be not good. When you over-help, over-serve, do not do self-care and take care of yourself, setting times for use, times for your family, times for your spouse, and times for God to be with you and pray, and you feel like you have to handle everything around you, any problem in the church, anything that needs a volunteer that nobody signed up for is your job, and you think you have to be God's hands and God's feet in every situation, do not be deceived. This is the work of the enemy to exhaust you. The yoke that God put on us, he said, is not heavy to bear. But yet, so many of us are exhausted, worn out, hopeless Christians. And that is not what God ever called you to. That is not doing the will of God. It is doing God's job. Codependent behavior also contains an element of pride. 
because it's got to be me that fills that responsibility. It's got to be me that saves the day. It's got to be me who rides in like a knight in shining armor, who rides in to rescue it, to make sure it comes off smoothly, that our day at the picnic is working well because of me organizing and having great skills. I got to save everybody from disaster and fix it all. There is pride in that thought pattern. And God says, no, 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 that is not the motivation of Christ-like service. Only do what God is calling you to do and let him work out the rest. He has other servants to rise up. And if you're always jumping in, they may never have an opportunity. Don't save people from natural consequences because the loved one you save from natural consequences, you're forcing them away from God instead of allowing their consequence to drive them to God. Because in pain, we are unfortunately driven to God. And you need to get out of God's way. Many times Jesus talks about giving us life. John 10:10. 10, 10, the thief does not come except to kill and steal and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and then they may have it more abundantly. This scripture leads you to conclude that God wants you to have your needs met. He wants you to have a abundant life. He does not want it full of busyness, schedules, and burdens, but a life full of joy, hope, and peace. Paul describes it well in Romans 15, 13, quote, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Is that abundant life, a different hope, to, a distant hope to you? Is it like a carrot that's being dangled on a string that's just unattainable, just too far out of reach? You're never going to reach it. You can't seem to get that promise. If you serve and you pray and you study and you read and you're selfless and you give and you volunteer, maybe then you'll get that abundant life. That's an erroneous thinking pattern. It's striving in codependent behaviors. There is no way to do enough to earn God or even people's love, acceptance, worthiness, joy, peace, or any kind of serenity. The only way to receive the promises of God is to abandon a performance-based thinking pattern, performance-oriented lifestyle and life skills that are codependent and learn to receive from God, learn to obey God, learn to apply the word, learn to remain and do as he calls you to do. Scripture out of context can be twisted into codependency, but that is not what the scripture teaches when it tells you to deny yourself or take up the cross or bear the burdens of another. God clearly says he wants you to have an abundant life. Yet on the other hand, Jesus commands you to deny yourself. So what does that mean? Proverbs 14, 12 urges you to die to the old men filled with ways that seem right to a man, but in the end lead you to death. Codependent patterns often feel right, but they are deceiving us. They are cognitive distortion when your emotions define what truth is. You cannot define truth by your emotions. The word defines truth, not your emotions. The old man was always aware of how people felt, what people needed, was always willing to tap dance around everybody to keep the peace. He, he wanted people to be pleased. You want to keep people happy. You want to feel like your needs are getting met. And so you do these things to keep people from being harmed, to solve the problem, to keep people from raging at you, or whatever the motivation may be. You receive the Lord, and you know God loves you. He died for you, and you are saved. Yet, you are an unrenewed Christian if you do not change your thinking and your life skills in any category or stronghold that is contrary to the word. And the stronghold we're describing is codependency. Emotionally, you are allowing the old man to remain alive. We are not supposed to let the old man alive. He's supposed to be crucified with Christ. 
If you are putting a little Christian suit on him and decorating and making him look all nice, trying to make him acceptable, you are not going to experience the kingdom of God the way that God intended you to have peace, to have the fruits of the Spirit, to have abundance and the promises of God. All the things that the scripture is saying about denial of self or putting to death things is talking about crucifying your old thinking and life skill patterns. It does not mean being a doormat. So God doesn't want you to be codependent anymore. He wants you to think and live differently than the old man that you learned in a dysfunctional family, dysfunctional culture, dysfunctional world. Sometimes the only way that you're going to meet your needs is for you to take the responsibility of meeting them in a godly way. Matthew 11, 28 and 30 says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. When I say that you should take up godly life skills to meet your needs, what is that first life skill? It is not going out and striving and clawing in ungodly patterns. It is to go to God first. Now, if you go to God and you pray, take this heavy burden off me, remove this stress from me, give me relief from these problems, but you do the life skills that are contrary to the word, it's not God's fault that you're still stuck. You're not doing the principles that he promised you would set you free. And if that's you, there's hope to change that. And this whole teaching is telling you that. When you're codependent, you are overburdened. You don't have time for God or yourself or anything that's important spiritually, emotionally, financially, or relationally because you're focused on solving and fixing things that are not your responsibility or burden. This is not the burden of a Christian servant. This is a boundaryless life that keeps you from receiving the abundance that God has for you. Codependent patterns are very familiar. They're comfortable. And we operate them in thinking, in speech, in natural knee-jerk reactions. And we, re we revolve around these codependent characteristics and we just keep cycling and cycling. And you think you're doing the right thing, but you're not in agreement to the word, as I believe this entire series is proving. You are following your own way and you have not died to yourself and killed the old man. So stop dressing up the old man. It's a sinful nature. You're dragging that corpse into your Christian experience, and then you wonder why you're not receiving the things that God promised. Codependency is following and pleasing man and self over God. You have to die to this. You've operated, if you've done this, in dysfunctional patterns, and false understandings and applied faulty belief systems into skills. You are the church of Jesus Christ. He's coming back for a spotless bride without wrinkle or blemish. We need to rid ourselves of these patterns that are not Christ-like. Who wants Christianity when they look at the person next to them who's stressed out and miserable? That's not appealing. Let's walk in the abundance that God has for us. The codependent patterns have to be identified and ripped down. They're strongholds. They rob you of your purpose, your joy, and your peace. You need to apply godly principles and tools. I am not the counselor that chats and listens. I am the counselor that teaches you how to apply tools. A, B, C, D, steps one, two, three, to pull down the thought, to discern things, and every single topic, I have stacks of handouts to teach you the how-to. We need to apply God principles, biblical principles that are right there in the scripture that can be boiled down into steps so that you can discern between godly and healthy skills versus ungodly and dysfunctional skills. And if you don't know what they are, then seek help, seek counsel, because this just doesn't go away on its own. You have to tear it down actively making a decision. This requires you to be responsible, to dig into God, to see what his word has to say about this, to study it and then apply it. 
It doesn't do you any good to have it all up here with no application. Listen and be led by God into brand new patterns so that you can receive the abundance that God has for you. Freedom and abundance are yours, but they are just one choice away. So begin that journey to make one step, line upon line, precept upon precept, to rip down codependent thinking and life skills and replace them with biblical principles. Okay, we're gonna open it up to questions. Anybody in the room, and if you're online and you have a question, by all means, please type in the bar any questions that you have, we want to answer them. If for any reason we ever miss your question, we will give you our contact information. Please stick around for that and you can email us. Questions? Well, Dr. Michelle, that was a phenomenal teaching, so thank you for that. Um, you're welcome. I, as I was listening, um, well, one comment that I want to make is um, to all of the listeners is that I have been the client um, that has gone to you to learn the godly life skills and to tear down codependency and to dramatically transform my life. Amen. So um, I just like to be a voice of encouragement to anybody that's listening that um, that it is possible and that I was certainly dressing up in the Christian clothes and but wasn't living it out and so I wasn't I wasn't I guess feeling all of or seeing all of God's glory and everything that was in store for me so just if you're in that place to definitely take the steps that we talked about in the teaching today. And to add to that, like Paul said, there should be a stark contrast. Who you were years yep. ago and who you are now is night and day. In fact, she's co-leader of this group. So we, we can be completely transformed. Yeah, that's definitely possible. Um, but kind of what you were talking about this evening with the uh, self-care I had to I had to not focus and not that I didn't care about others, but I really focused for probably a two year time span on me and to make sure that I was caring for myself and that my heart and soul was whole before I able to do that and seen what God's plan was for me had I not because you were because called I, to do the work of sanctification yep. so then you can be used and you took the time to be obedient to do that which a lot of people want to skip that step but it's very important so very. I just wanted to make that thank comment. you for sharing um, a couple things that you had said that I just some people I know that some people um, in the room here but not everyone online might not know the terminology so this might help you said um, at one point during the teaching, um, you mentioned cognitive distortion. So it might help if we just, I, I know that you've defined it before, but it's just to I'll define, define it over and over and over I because mean, the I, church I desperately all, needs to know it. <laughs> I hear it all the time from you. I think every church should teach that there are 10 cognitive distortions. What is a cognitive distortion? It is a twisted thinking pattern. So when you think that this always happens or this never happens or it happened before so it's going to happen again you did that to me before so it's going to happen again i know what you're thinking and i know what's going to happen next week these are all cognitive distortions if i let emotions define what truth is it's a cognitive distortion a cognitive distortion is a twink a twisted thinking pattern and what's more important is every cognitive distortion is a sin pattern of thinking. We need to identify those thinking patterns that are contrary. When we say over generalization that everything is always going to end up like it was in the past, we leave no room for God to change anything. Oh, that person over there, they're just the same as they'll always be. They're never going to change. I just operated in a cognitive distortion and I totally emasculated God and his ability to work in someone's life. I don't want to do that. We need to learn to tear down the distortions because they come out of our mouth. Um, one other question. Um, well, I guess two comments slash questions. 
Um, so I guess one of the things that you had talked about was serving um, in the church. So this is kind of two part. So how do you know when to serve and then when to self care? And then the second part of the question is, I think that there's a, I don't think, I know that there is a, um, a assumption by probably our, just our society that if you're single, that you just have all the time in the world <laughs> and that you don't need to take care of your home and take care of, you know, if you have a pet or family, um, nieces and nephews, clean your home. I mean, there's a variety of things that even if you're single and you don't have a, a wife or a husband or um, kids that you just have nothing else to do but work sleep eat and then you can just serve everyone and there are going to be people who think like that and it's up to you to be responsible to set the boundary draw the line and correct them which means assertive skills which means communication you have to do that you can't get mad at people because they don't get it people are not going to get it sometimes and we just have to assert ourselves and say I appreciate you asking me. Thank you for asking me. I, I'm glad you considered me. But right at this time, I have a lot of things on my plate, and this would not be something I can do. I'm sorry. It's just a simple communication assertive skill, and we got to learn how to do that and learn when to do that. We, you know, we can just take on too much because in the church we see needs and we care. So, and I've done that in my past. In fact, bef when I started this ministry, it's been 18 years, and for that year before, I was working on it. God was telling me, you got to drop everything else. He kept banging on my door. You got to stop. You got to stop. You got to stop. Because I would do dinners for eight in the church, and I was in the music ministry, and I taught a Bible study, and, and then there was nobody for singles groups. So I said, okay, I'll lead singles group. Okay, no, no. He said, those are all good things, and you're good at all of them, but that's not what you're called to. You're called to do this. Drop it all. When I started this ministry, I had to quit by command of God everything. That was so hard. It was so hard because it was everything I was used to doing. I'm thinking, but I can still do that. Well, not really now that I see how much I needed to do, how much he wanted me to do. I can't do anything well if I'm doing too much and things I'm not supposed to do. And that happens in churches. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, I think that, I think I thought that I had another question, but I think that's it. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Michelle. Mm -hmm. I need to know, um, as you go through um, tearing down strongholds and um, the old man, getting rid of the old man, one is, is that the process they call sanctification? Yes. Okay. Is there kind of like a time frame, you know, of doing the... Forever. <laughs> What I usually tell people is there is no such thing as arriving. You're gonna, it's like layers of an onion. You're gonna peel, peel, peel. Then you're gonna think, wow, I'm just, I figured I overcame all this. It's done. And then something else is gonna come and you're gonna go, okay, peel, 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 peel. And you're gonna constantly be moving forward. But when it comes to the cognitive distortions, I tell people success is not that you'll never have a distortion. It's that you will identify it and immediately reframe it to agree with the Word of God. And that's success. So learning to do that as quickly as possible is what success is. Yes, yes. I was, I was just thinking that, you know, sanctification is a life. Yeah, ongoing. Do not get mm -hmm. to the point of, well, we're done. I've arrived. You know? yeah. <laughs> um, we arrive when we get to heaven and then he finishes us. Thank yeah, God. Right? Yeah. But um, thank you so much. You're welcome. Any other questions? Okay, that's it for the questions. We okay, great. Well, we are really glad that you joined us. If you have not watched this entire series, I believe that this is teaching eight in this series. Go back and look at all of them. If you would like the printed copy, because this is one chapter at a time of a book, then you can email us or write to us for a donation and partnership of any amount. We will send you the printed copies. 
and we encourage you to please send out this information that's so important. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe, click the bell so you get the notifications of everything we put out, and by all means, like it and share it to your friends and neighbors. If you'd like to contact us, our number is 904 730-0775. Our website is www.drmichelle.org. That is D-R-M-I-C-H-E-L-E dot org. Michelle with one L. We are glad you joined us. We really encourage you to take this information and move forward and apply it. If you need counseling services, we offer Christian counseling via Skype, FaceTime, phone, and locally in our Florida office. We want to hear from you, so by all means, feel free to contact us. Thank you.